Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for April 16th, 2018. On today's show, we're going to go to the water cooler and talk about what we've been up to and talk a little bit about the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serrata, and I am back. Joining me today is Slash Film Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? I want to thank you both and the the rest of the team for uh, taking care of business while I have been away, uh, which I'll, actually join me by the water cooler. We'll talk about it. <laughs> um, I uh, went on um, a vacation last week. I was on a Disney cruise, which I, I've been on a Disney cruise before. Uh, this is the first time I, I've gone with uh, my, my girlfriend, Kitra. It, uh, it was her first time. Uh, she absolutely loved it. It was uh, it featured Star Wars Day at Sea, which is like a whole day of like Star Wars uh, celebrations on on the cruise ship, um, including like you know showing the the movies. They had appearances from a lot of the characters in costume, um, and um, it, it, it was a lot of fun. I uh, amongst the things I did on uh, that day is I saw this presentation. Uh, they, they have people. Uh, from the making of the films, come on the boat and give presentations. Uh, the one for the trip I was on was not that um, exciting on paper. It was, you know, some people are getting, you know, like, you know, Dave Filoni or Warwick Davis or Anthony Daniels or uh, Ashley Atkinson. Um, you know, we got Russell Paul. Do you know who Russell Paul is? No. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't either. Um, Russell Paul is uh, he's at Industrial Light and Magic. He is the digital assets manager. Um, now I know that doesn't sound like the most exciting presentation, but it was actually pretty cool because uh, they, basically he was talking about um, the evolution of uh, mainly like CG ships in Star Wars uh, from you know. Uh, the prequels, because he worked on the prequels all the way up until, you know, the current films. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you the gist of the presentation because I, I think this is actually kind of an interesting bit of information. Um, in the old uh, days of the original Star Wars films, they would have model makers create these ships at some kind of scale. And um, because they didn't have a lot of time or money, they would to make details on these ships, they would open like a, do you know those like model kits that you could buy at like a hobby shop of like, you know, spaceships or cars and, mm -hmm. you know, you put them together. They would buy those. They would have like racks and racks. You can actually find photos online of this, like, you know, ILM's old like racks of model kits. And they would basically just steal parts off those model kits and put them on like the Millennium Falcon or the X-Wing or, or whatnot. And like a lot of those little details of those ships are actually not things that ILM created but repurposed from uh, freely available model kits. And um, uh, Russell was talking about how in uh, the prequel era, there, uh, they were creating these ships in CG, which is you know groundbreaking, but uh, didn't have a lot of detail to them. And um, what they have gone and done with the new Star Wars movies is they've actually gone and uh, gone online because a lot of these... Um, you know, fan sites have chronicled, like, you know, every single piece on the Millennium Falcon that came from, like, a model kit. You know, this came from the Falcon 9 model kit. This came from, you know, like, all these little pieces. And they've actually digitally uh, recreated these model kit pieces into the computer uh, and created a library of, you know, thousands of, like, these little pieces so that now when they create Star Wars ships... They can, you know, take these pieces and like digitally do what ILM was doing back in, you know, the 70s and 80s and actually, you know, fill out the details with like these p these computer computerized versions of the model kits. I don't know. I, I just thought that was kind of cool that uh, I, I never would have known about that if you had not tell me, told me that right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it, it, it was very cool to see. I wish I almost uh, I wish I had videotaped it. I, I do have some photos that we'll put up on the set at some point. Um but uh, I, I'm, and I apologize in advance to you guys and to the listeners because I have a lot to talk about because I've just been away for a week. Um, but uh, we visited, uh, you know, you visit a bun bunch of ports, and uh, one of the ports I visited was Saint Martin, and um, uh, it was 
destroyed, like devastated by uh, Hurricane Irma. And, uh, you know, still it's like seven months later, like still um, much of that island. It, it was crazy and humbling and scary to see how much of that island like still had not recovered. You know, second stories of houses completely, you know, blown off. Uh, ships, you know, uh, basically capsized on uh, on the uh, the shores. Um, just like I don't know, it, it's just it. It seems to me if they've made this little progress in seven months, it's going to take you know many years for them to, to recover. And it was uh, very scary to see what uh, you know. I, I know you can watch this on on the news when you know the hurricane happened and we've been seeing that but like seeing it in person is just crazy and i uh honestly wasn't expecting to see that going there i was expecting to see um a more more recovered uh island but um one of the interesting things i did on uh saint martin um is i visited a this place called the yoda guy movie exhibit um it turns out this guy nick Malley who is known as the Yoda guy um, is uh, he's a famous uh, makeup uh, designer. Um, he worked on the original star Wars movies. He um, claims to be one of the guys that created Yoda. I'm not, I haven't delved into the, the, the claim that claims, but uh, he, he has kind of like this uh, movie museum that he's built on this like little Island and you can pay to go see it. And he, he's retired now and he, uh, there's a little gift shop there, and every day he's in the gift shop signing, uh, you know, little pieces of reproduction artwork of Yoda for you know little kids that come, you know, via cruise ship. And it, it was it, it was, you know, I, I'm not sure. I didn't pay to go to see the museum. I could see it from the nooks and crannies, and it didn't look like anything I really needed to see. It looked like um, a lot of reproduction stuff that you could you know see at the sideshow booths at uh, Comic Con, but. Um, I did see Nick talking to a bunch of like young kids about uh, their dreams and stuff. And it seemed really inspiring. And uh, I know this is one of the, the highest rated places on that whole Island on TripAdvisor. So uh, if you're there, it's worth checking out um, two last things. <laughs> I, uh, while I was on dry land, I did get to see two movies of uh, one of which was a quiet place. Um, have you guys seen this yet? Yes. Indeed we have. Um, I saw this at uh, b the day before I went to see. I saw it at an AMC theater in Disney Springs, which uh, if you're on the West Coast, that's the equivalent of seeing a movie at City Walk. So it's probably not the, you know, the best movie theater to see a movie at because, you know, there's tons of tourists and uh, loudmouths. And uh, I love this movie. This movie is great. I, I highly recommend it to everybody. But... Um, for the first 30 or 45 minutes of this movie, it was rough guys. Like, uh, my audience, th this is a movie. If you haven't seen any of the trailers, it's fully dependent on silence. And the tension is based on, you know, if the characters in on screen are making any noise whatsoever. So it's, it's almost like plays as a silent movie for, for a lot of it. And, um, and being in a movie theater where people are not only, you know, talking to their friends next to them on their phones, uh, even if there there wasn't those inconsiderate people. If there's like there was a guy next to me that was like breathing heavy, like he wasn't asleep or snoring, but he was just breathing really heavy. And that was like so distracting. And I uh, as much as I enjoyed this film, I almost wish I could have. This is like one of the first times I'm going to say this. This is. I, I wish this is a film that I highly recommend, you know, it could be, you know, in my top 20 of the year, but I wish I had seen it at home, you know, in, in a quiet environment by myself. Do, did you guys have any bad experiences seeing this movie? Uh, I saw it at a press screening, so things were relatively quiet. But I know that uh, Chris Evangelista has decided to just wait until like the movie is practically almost out of theaters before <laughs> he goes to see it, just to avoid those issues. But Brad, I think you saw it in like a public screening, right? What was your experience like? I did. Yeah, I saw it um, during the week, and uh, it was the week after it had been um, opened. And my uh, audience was surprisingly respectful. I uh, I was kind of worried because sometimes there are a few people who are just assholes and decide to get out their phones or talk 
um, unnecessarily. And for this movie, the 30 or so people that were in there uh, were very quiet. People were even trying to stifle their snacking. Like you could hear them <laughs> trying to be quiet, and it was like it. It was like it wasn't loud enough to be disrupting, but you could hear just, just like them slowly like moving their wrapper, trying to make like <laughs> the smallest amount of sound possible. That, that, um, that sometimes makes things worse, by the way, guys. It, I, it, I, it, it, sometimes, sometimes it does, but in, the, in this case, it didn't. Um, but it just, yeah, I, I was, I was very surprised, and it was, I was able to enjoy it thoroughly. Uh, I, you know, even people chewing popcorn in this movie could be distracting. Uh, Davindra on the Slash Film Cast, I think, was talking about how you know his 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 wife was, you know, it was one of those movies where you take a, a kernel of popcorn and you put it in your mouth and you let it dissolve because you can't <laughs> chew because you know it'll dis- disrupt the theater. Um, I, I really thought a lot of this movie was so clever. Uh, I, I would say listen to the Slash Film Cast uh, review of it because I think they accurately uh, relayed my thoughts on it. It, it. it was a little surprising. There are moments that like, wow, this movie's so clever. Why this and this choice late in the movie like seems really not on the same level. <laughs> but uh, they talk about it on the Slash Film Cast. I'm not going to go into spoilers here. Uh, the other movie I saw... Um, which Brad, I think you saw Blockers, right? I did. Um, I really enjoyed. I didn't expect to like this movie. It was another movie I was seeing with my movie pass, and um, it's uh, it's not my favorite comedy of the year. I'd still put that for uh, uh, a game night. Uh, but it, it was a lot of fun, and I uh, I almost wonder if like they they hurt themselves by not calling the movie Cock Blockers, like why this Rooster Blockers or or chicken block, whatever that symbol is. Like, do, do you think, like, Brad, do you think that hurt people going to see the movie? I mean, it wasn't, I don't think it was up to them because I think that it's it's a rule that your title can't have blatant profanity in it. So they probably can't call it cock blockers, which is why they called it blockers to begin with. Hmm. Um, But I, I don't think that was what, made the movie maybe not look as appealing because um, we I, we talked about this movie on my podcast, Go Flix Yourself. We watched the trailer and we talked about um, just our thoughts on it and nobody who was on, on, on with us was impressed or interested. I thought the trailer made it look like a stupid comedy. Uh, there was nothing really all that funny about it. It just seemed like a real dud and I was so surprised when I heard such great reviews coming out of South by Southwest and saw the high Rotten Tomato score and so many people that I respect their opinion, especially when it comes to comedy, were saying that it was great. And so I, I gave it a shot and went to see it, and I was thoroughly surprised at how good it was. Um, I actually think maybe what hurt them more so was not tipping their hat that the, the, the story at the core of it is a little bit more progressive than it might seem. Uh, you know, the idea of what you know some of the characters go through and what the parents learn about their, you know, uh, sort of archaic positions on their kids' sexuality, especially when it comes to female sexuality and that kind of thing, uh, maybe hurt it. But then again, maybe they held that back because they didn't want to uh, ruin any chances of people from the conservative side of the aisle going to see this movie. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, but it's, I, yeah, I was very surprised at how good it was. It's very, very funny, um, and I, I, I would recommend that people go see it. Now, I, I know. I'm still not on the John Cena train, guys. Like I, I'm an old school wrestling fan. I, I, I watched wrestling when John Cena, you know, was starting out. Um, I like him as a person. I liked him as a wrestler. I don't watch wrestling anymore. Um, but in in a comedy sense, like he was okay in this because I feel like the the script, whoever wrote the script, I think wrote it for him. It, it seems to me. But he only has like three different facial expressions. Like he doesn't have much range. Uh, Brad. Am I wrong? No, I don't entirely uh, disagree with you. Um, he, he's not quite as good as uh, Dwayne Johnson. Um, and there, there's something about him that feels very limiting. It, sometimes it feels like he's trying too hard to be funny, um, even though he can be very funny. But I, I don't know. There, there's something about his demeanor and his, um, I don't know, his, his, his line reading, just the way he presents himself that doesn't, always fit with the the character that he's projecting. I feel like there are only a few kinds of characters that he can play. Um, some of it's due to his size, some of it's due to his personality. And yeah, it, it's, it's sometimes it just doesn't quite work for him uh, on a comedy level. 
Yes. Well, b- Blockers, I would, you know, recommend if you have a movie pass, go check it out. If uh, if you don't, you know, wait until home video. This is a perfect film to, you know, rent on a Friday night. Uh, a Quiet Place, I would highly recommend you see. But choose wisely where and when and with who you see it. Uh, Brad, what have you been up to? Well, uh, this past weekend, we celebrated a friend's birthday. And so we had this whole plan. Um to do stuff in Chicago on Sunday. So uh, we did an escape room, which is really cool. It was uh, the escape game, which is a big chain who does escape room stuff all over the country, which was uh, pretty great. But the funnest thing was after that, we went to this um, bar called Public House where they have these epic milkshakes where they bring you out the milkshake and uh, just as if you were getting a Bloody Mary for brunch uh, that puts a bunch of food and stuff on your drink. Uh, they bring out a milkshake and they have a slice of cake that's on top of it, and the cup is like uh, on the outside of it. The rim and the um, around there is like slathered with frosting and sprinkles and stuff, and it's just one of like the most fantastic milkshakes that I've ever had. It was incredible. Um, it sounds I, like a place I've I, I've had in uh, Las Vegas called Holstein's. I think it's called, uh, which okay. is insane milkshakes. They just have like candy and cakes and what it, like you know. Almost the toppings that are coming out of the cup are bigger than the milkshake itself. Yeah, exactly. And then I also had macaroni and cheese with chorizo, which was kind of life-changing. And I want chorizo in all of my macaroni and cheese from now on. Um, (laughs) But the coolest thing is, uh, after that, we went to a place called Catcade, which is this combination arcade and cat rescue shelter, where they have a few custom arcade cabinets set up where you can play a bunch of different classic arcade video games. But then the room is also full of, like, 20 or so cats just hanging out and walking around and sleeping on their cat trees and playing with you. So you can walk around and pet them. And, you know, they hop up in your lap. And uh, just, it, was, it was just so cool. There were so many awesome cats there. And it was it's just a cool little place. And you can adopt the cats that are there. And it's a, just a fun little mashup of, you know, just two different things that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find together. Now, I've heard of cat cafes, but I've never heard of a cat cade. Like, are the cats coming up to you while you're playing the games? Or is yeah, it like a separate mean, area? <laughs> well, no, that's what's kind of funny. Is so, like, the, uh, a couple of the arcade machines they have are the tabletop ones, where it's, it's like a table and you're looking down at the game. And because of the screen surface gets warm, sometimes the cat will just jump on top of it and they'll just sit down and lay on it because it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's just hilarious. They just walk around. They, the cool thing is... They all, <laughs> You're like, damn they, it, I'm, I was near my high score. <laughs> the cat um, sat on the have, screen. They have these custom um, arcade cabinets that are... They, they look like regular arcade cabinets, but they just have like uh, three different cat beds in them so that the cats can, can sleep in them it's, it's, it's just really cool <laughs> i uh i have a donkey kong arcade machine and uh when i had cats uh my cats would uh jump onto the sh- bookshelf next to the machine and then jump up on top of the machine that was on my uh, second floor of my loft area and it would overlooking the entire apartment um and they would hang out on top of the arcade yeah, these, machine these cats did that too yeah. Uh and uh th- that's all you've been up to? Uh yeah, pretty much. Um like I said I saw blockers in a quiet place, but Wait, wait, uh, wait. Did you win the escape escape room? We did actually. We um I I'm not sure what the difficulty level was. I want to say it was one of the middle ones. Um but we uh we did it pretty quickly too. We had 19 minutes left in our hour. I feel like these get easier the more you do of them because you you kind of get to see the like the uh you know, the types of puzzles and you kind of understand what needs to be done. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, ben, what have you been up to? Well, it's going to be really difficult to top Cat Cade. Uh, <laughs> I would say impossible because that sounds pretty amazing. But uh, I recently got a Hulu subscription and my wife and I watched the first season of The Handmaid's Tale. So I know I'm very behind on that. But we both had recently read Margaret Atwood's novel and then decided that after we both finished the book, we would finally bite the bullet, get Hulu, and go ahead and, and dive into the show. And it is really great, guys. If you've not seen The Handmaid's Tale, I'd highly recommend it. It's very... Uh, it's bleak, but I would I, I think because I read the book and knew what was coming, it was a lot easier for me to handle. I, I can't really imagine the idea of like going into the show completely cold and having no idea what the concept is because it would be 
uh, very, very upsetting. I mean, it's upsetting subject matter anyway, but um, just the way it sort of presented so matter of factly would be uh, maybe even off putting. But um, I think this is a, a really exceptional adaptation. It's the first season essentially tracks with the book. And I'm very interested to see what happens in season two because they're going completely off book and, and beyond. Uh, what has already been laid out. And I think HT actually wrote uh, a review of Handmaid's Tale Season 2 that just went up on Slash Home this morning. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm looking forward to checking that out. So uh, maybe we can link to that in the show notes and people can check it out. But um, yeah, I just wanted to give a, a quick shout out to the first season of The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, Reed Morano directed the first three episodes and really set the visual style and tone for the show in the same way that David Fincher did with uh, House of Cards. And it's um, a really gorgeous, beautiful looking piece of, of TV work. So I'd highly recommend checking that out. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention wait, is... Wait a um, second. I just want oh, to say, yeah. I love that you and your wife concurrently read books together. That That is so <laughs> great. Well, she read it and then I read it. Oh, but, okay. Uh, but yeah, we so we're, we're not like uh, sitting in in uh, I Love Lucy beds and like flipping <laughs> pages at the same time and <laughs> different copies of the book. But uh, but yeah, we like to try to do that. You know, if there's something that we're both interested in, we'll grab the book and then uh, one of us will read it first and the other one will read it pretty closely after that so we can talk about it. So we've got a little uh, married people book club going on between the two of us. But yeah, um, yeah the, the other thing I wanted to mention was the Andre the Giant documentary that's on HBO. Have either of you had a chance to check that out i have not and i am you know a huge wrestling fan from way back and i love andre the giant so i'm i'm very interested to see this but i have not seen it yet yeah so, i haven't seen it either but i've heard that's really good yeah i was a little disappointed i mean it's it's good but i think because i have seen like the bonus features of the princess bride and so a lot of the the documentary is about Andre the Giant, who's a professional wrestler who had gigantism, and the doc essentially follows the, the his entire career. But it's sort of surface level. Like I'll, most of the documentary um, tells the story of the lead up to I think it's WrestleMania three, the big one where uh, Andre the Giant faced off against Hulk Hogan, and that was like his sort of swan song, essentially his swan song from from wrestling and. If you, I feel like I'd, I'd already knew all the information that they presented there. It, it's always still interesting to see different people's take on it and like some of the footage that maybe you hadn't quite seen before. But in terms of like um, being a revealing documentary, it didn't really do much for me. It didn't do much to tell me much about him as a person that I didn't already know. And then, like I mentioned, it, he played one of the characters in the in A Princess Bride and, um, if you've seen the bonus features, if you've seen interviews with Rob Reiner and uh, Billy Crystal and stuff like that before, all these characters who are uh, actors and creators who were making that movie, they've spoken about him on the record in, in bonus features and stuff like that before. And they essentially just repeat themselves for this documentary. So I was a little disappointed that it didn't really dive too deeply under the surface. But if you are completely unfamiliar with Andre the Giant, I that's really who it's it's for. It's it's basically playing to as broad an audience as possible. It's not necessarily trying to um, uh, illuminate any aspects of his life that people didn't already know uh, if you're already familiar with him to begin with. Well, I am excited to check this out. Um, and I would I, I want to uh, slip in here if if you are looking for a documentary about pro wrestling, maybe not, uh, you know, a person a personality from pro wrestling. I would recommend one of the two following documentaries, Beyond the Mat, which I think was produced by Ron Howard, is in a, a fantastic look at uh, pro wrestling in like the late '90s, and uh, Hitman Heart. Wrestling with Shadows. I'm not sure if that's available anywhere, but uh, th that is also another great look at th that time period of wrestling and very honest, both of those documentaries. Um, but we are running really late because of my uh, huge water cooler uh, story. But let's get into the news. Uh, this one's going to go late, and I'm just going to, we're just going to have to accept it. Uh, let's start off with a bit of sad news, and that is the uh, death of Miles Foreman. Uh, Brad, tell us about it. Yes, unfortunately, uh, the director behind the Best Picture winners, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and Amadeus, passed away just before the weekend began. Uh, he was 86 years old, and it was confirmed by his uh, representatives um, in Czechoslovakia, which is where he is from, or rather the nation formerly known as Czechoslovakia. 
Um, it's, uh, you know, a heartbreaking loss, but, um, you know, but he obviously lived a full life. Um, he hadn't really been working on films for, uh, quite some time. The last Hollywood movie he made was Goya's Ghosts back in 2006. And even when he was at his most active, he would still take long breaks, uh, between his movies. You know, they were, they were consistently anywhere between, uh, four and seven years between the projects that he decided to make. Uh, but even with such a a relatively small filmography, he still made quite an influence. So yeah, as we know, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Amadeus are two of the uh, greatest films that have ever been made, um, as also determined, you know, confirmed by the Academy itself. Uh, he was also behind um, some other prominent films uh, that stirred up, you know, different kinds of controversy and things like that, such as uh, The People vs. Larry Flint. And he was also the director behind The Man on the Moon biopic about comedian Andy Kaufman that starred Jim Carrey. Uh, which just recently had a documentary diving into his meta performance about it and the the difficulty that uh, Milos Forman had in trying to reel in Jim Carrey's meta performance during that whole production. Uh, so definitely, uh, you know, a, a sad loss for us, but he, he leaves behind a pretty great legacy of films uh, for us to continue to be influenced by. Yeah, it, it's a disappointing loss. And, uh, you know, that documentary you mentioned, Jim and Andy, there's a scene where it's a phone call between him and uh, uh, is it Jim? No, it's not Jim Carrey. It's a, it's a, a phone call of, uh, between the director and Jim Carrey playing uh, Andy Kaufman because he's still in character and basically the director like so frustrated that he, you know, is not able to work with Jim Carrey and and uh you know, uh, Andy basically says, you know, I, I, I could, you know, get Jim to come in and do this role for you. He could do an impression for you. And you, you just see uh, Foreman like he's just so disappointed with the whole experience. Uh, it's a great documentary. I check that out, but also check out his, you know, great movies. Uh, you, you know, he shouldn't be remembered just for. For, for that last uh, one of those last uh, films, um, but yes, let's get into some Marvel Studios news, and that is a rumor that Marvel is developing an Eternals movie. Ben, tell us about it. Yeah, so Bleeding Cool uh, has a tip that Marvel is developing a film based on the Eternals, which are a, a alien race of characters that were created by Jack Kirby, who is uh, one of the the great comic book personalities of all time uh this this group is essentially uh, an alien race called the celestials which you guys will know have been featured in the marvel movies before visited earth five million years ago and performed genetic experiments on early life that was on earth and it it essentially unlocked the power for uh, mutations to exist and mutants to become to come into being later on and this process created two races called the Eternals and the Deviants in the process. So this is a, a pretty classic cosmic kind of story that we've seen a, a lot of in recent comic book history or all throughout comic book history, really. And uh, anything Kirby related is going to be very cosmic and out there. And uh, this is no different. It, it's really about these bizarre races and the the Eternals gaining godlike powers over the years. At certain points, they actually uh, impersonate the ancient Greek gods and trick the people of Greece into thinking that they are, you know, Zeus and all of these kinds of characters. Um, and like I mentioned, we've seen the Celestials in the MCU already. So this rumor that an Eternals movie is on the way sort of makes sense because we know that Marvel is planning on branching out even further into the cosmic realm once uh, Avengers 4 has wrapped up. And uh, it's interesting because Thanos, the villain of Avengers Infinity War, is actually an Eternal. He's a member of, of one of those races. So this movie could provide a springboard to potentially tell more stories about other members of that alien race. So I don't know. It, it's one of those things where we're still waiting on to see if, if Marvel Studios is actually going to confirm this. Uh, this is just one of those things that's like whispered about right now. But it's it's a rumor that makes a lot of sense, especially considering that DC Films is currently working on their own Jack Kirby related cosmic project with new gods, which is going to be directed by Ava DuVernay. So it will be interesting to see if uh, there are two Kirby related cosmic projects that coexist in the blockbuster landscape at the same time. You know, it's just so weird because I feel like, you know, we've been 
covering the Marvel movies for so long. We've been watching the Marvel movies for so long. And, you know, from the point that we hit Avengers, we knew that they were heading towards Infinity War. And I like we really have no idea what comes after Infinity War. You know, we know that the scrolls are going to be involved and maybe there's going to be a secret war. But like, I, I really just have no idea what where the MCU is going to go uh, after Infinity War. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, but speaking of Infinity War, you know, we're less than, what, two weeks away from Infinity War. And uh, there's a bit of casting news. Brad, tell us about it. Yes, um, in Avengers Infinity War, in addition to bringing together all of the uh, famous superheroes that have starred in the long 10 years of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, there will be some new characters entering the fray. Um, Among them are the aliens known as the Black Order, which are basically Thanos' adopted children who he uh, sends to Earth to do his bidding, uh, presumably maybe pick up some stray Infinity Stones and deal with the Avengers before he gets there himself. Um, so far, we've, we've seen these characters in some brief footage from, from the trailers, and we've heard about them, but we have yet to know who is actually playing them and voicing them in the movie. Uh, the Russo brothers had teased that we would know who some of the people are playing these, these characters, but without giving away any specifics. But today we found out that uh, actress Carrie Coon will be playing Proxima Midnight, who is the one female member uh, of this um, alien order of Thanos' warriors. You might remember her from uh, season three of Fargo, uh, The Leftovers, or Gone Girl. Uh, Most recently she was also in The Post. And then um, some of the other members of the Black Order, there's four of them. Uh, Irish actor Tom Von Lawler will be playing Ebony Maw, uh, who we've seen in the trailers as well. Um, He has uh, telekinetic powers. And then Terry Notary, who is most famous for doing some of the motion capture work for uh, the apes in War for the Planet of the Apes, uh, actually the whole franchise, and Kong Skull Island, will be playing uh, the large member of the Black Order, Cull Obsidian. The only one that we don't know so far uh, who um, who the actor who's playing this uh, member of the Black Order is Corvus Glaive. And so we're that's the only one they're waiting to find out on. Um, I'm part of me is wondering if maybe if Peter Dinklage will be the one providing the voice <laughs> for that character, since he is officially part of the cast and we still haven't heard who he's playing. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's anyone's guess as to who will play that fourth member. It's weird. When I was on set of this movie, you know, they couldn't tell us who was playing these characters. It almost seemed like they had not been cast. Um, Do you think that this is something happening late in production, that this is like a voice casting role and they they weren't involved on set? Um, I definitely think there's a chance of that happening. Um, Sometimes you see that happening with animated movies where they know exactly how they want a character to look, but they haven't quite found the right voice to do it justice yet. Or, you know... um, Sometimes they'll, they'll end up figuring out that the placeholder voice that they had initially ends up being the best one after they try to find somebody to do it. So, yeah, yeah maybe they were taking their time figuring out who the best voice was for these characters, or maybe it was just something that they you know kept under wraps this whole time just because they didn't feel like it was something they needed to put out there right away. Who knows? Yeah, and there was um, the case of... Uh of Groot on guardians of the galaxy. You know, it was rumored that Vin Diesel was going to be playing that part, but he was not on set, uh, playing that role. You know, he came in later. So maybe it's another case of that. Um, let's move on to news about the new Terminator sequel that we've been talking about from Tim Miller and James Cameron. Uh, we finally have some casting, a new Terminator. Ben, tell us about it. Yes, Gabriel Luna, who you might recognize as playing Ghost Rider on Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., has been cast as a new Terminator in this new untitled Terminator film. So uh, we know he's going to be a villain, and essentially that's all the the hard news that we had. About a year ago, James Cameron, who's producing this film, spoke about how they were looking for an 18-year-old woman to serve as the movie's new lead character. And then not long after that, a different report specified that Cameron and... Tim Miller, who's the guy who directed Deadpool, who's also directing this movie, we're looking for a Mexican actress to play that character, and that character's name is going to be Danny Ramos, uh, D-A-N-I Ramos, and that same report said that 
a good portion of this new Terminator film is going to take place in Mexico City and that the team was looking for a Latin actor with fighting and, and stunt experience to play a new villain. So it seems like they've found that person in Gabriel Luna. So uh, that's kind of an interesting new direction for the Terminator franchise, which has not really delved into. I mean, it, it's not a, a it's a pretty white franchise. We'll put it that way. <laughs> um, and so Re, I guess that's one of James Cameron's big things with this film, right? Is like the idea of uh, updating the concept and making it relevant for the 21st century and moving it to Mexico City, moving the plot to Mexico City and essentially decreasing the whiteness of the of the whole thing really globalizes the product in a, in a way that uh, that we haven't seen from a Terminator movie before. So I'm interested to see how this whole thing turns out. We're still there's still so much we don't know about this film and it's it's pretty early on in the process. The movie doesn't come out until uh, November 22nd of 2019. So we still have more than a year uh, before we're actually going to get any real idea of what this film is is truly about. Okay, uh, n- next up in the news is, uh, well, it's not a bit of news. It, Brad, you went to Pixar a couple weeks back, or was it last week? It was a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, and you can finally talk about that. I, I we, You know, I don't want to give any spoilers. I don't want to talk about, uh, you know, plot points from the movie. I just want to get your um, overall impression of Incredibles 2, uh, because you saw, like, what, 35 minutes of footage? Yeah, they showed us the first 22 minutes uh, from the from the movie, and then they showed us three other scenes that composed another 13 minutes of the film. So, wh- what did you think without giving anything away? Um, I was very impressed. Um, it is it's pretty much exactly what I want from an Incredibles movie, and I think that it's very intriguing because uh, they didn't give away a whole lot of the of the story. We know some things, but there's a lot of stuff that we're still left in the dark about, and uh, I, I really like the setup. I, I love how the animation has progressed in the 14 years since the original movie came out. The the core of this being a family movie first and a superhero movie second is still there. It's uh, still focusing on just this, this family of people who happen to have superheroes trying to live their life as best uh, and normally as they can while still staying true to who they are. You know, they, they have still have the, the funny family bickering that everyone will be able to identify with when they see it, on, you know, on screen. You'll, you'll see a little bit of your own family, you know, in certain parts of this. And it's just the the action in this, too, is absolutely astounding, uh, especially w- with how much um, incredible, like, advancements that have been made in the uh, animation department. Uh, you know, the if you go back and you watch the original Incredibles... Uh, comparing the animation alone to what Pixar can do today is crazy because you remember The Incredibles as being one of Pixar's most sophisticated and beautiful looking movies, and it still is on some level, but there are certain sequences in that movie and some some pieces of animation where it feels like it's a couple layers off from being a final cut for Pixar. Um, and that just goes to show you how far animation has come in a 14-year span. And so seeing what they can do now, especially when it comes to the fast-paced action sequences and how much detail there is, uh, in character design and the the environments from you know Municiburg and uh, chase sequences and all these things, it's just, it really just is mesmerizing and astounding. Um, if I only had one little complaint, it's that following the opening, the exciting opening sequence, it feels like maybe there's a little too much of an extended period of exhibition and um, kind of I guess wordy character development, you would say. But at the same time, I, I also rewatched The Incredibles recently, um, just before I had go- gone out to to Pixar, and that's kind of how the first movie works too. Is it open? It ha- opens up with a with a big exciting sequence with Mr. Incredible, you know, uh, saving the day a few different times. But then afterwards, there's a lot of development of showing how you know mundane his life has become since superheroes became illegal and that kind of thing. Um, so. I, I feel like maybe that's just something in my mind that I was I got caught up in the action, then things slowed down a bit for a little while, and you, you kind of felt it. So um, that might be a concern maybe for kids going to see this movie. They might get a little bit bored in some parts, but The Incredibles, I feel like, maybe has always been one of the more, I guess you could say, grown-up movies in Pixar's library. So maybe that's that's fine for uh, for what it is, but... For for me, I'm I'm so excited to see the rest of this movie. There's still so much stuff that we don't know and that we haven't seen 
Um, and it's this should be something that delivers a, a, a worthy successor to the original movie. Yeah, we, we link in the show notes uh, your report on the first 35 minutes, your impressions. And we'll also link some of your other coverage from the event because uh, you, you did like these uh, roundtable discussions with all the crew and cast of, of the movie, right? So um, Yeah. Yeah, there's we we have uh, some stories we ran today. There's a, there's a couple more that'll be that, um coming in uh, leading up to the release of the movie. Um, so yeah, go ahead and check those out. Okay, our final story. Uh, we've gone way over, but I think we do need to cover this today, and that is that a lawsuit it may be holding up Mad Max Fury Road sequels from happening. Ben, what do we know? Yeah, this is kind of a sad story. So George Miller's production company, Kennedy Miller Mitchell, is locked in a legal battle with Warner Brothers right now. George Miller was the guy who directed uh, the Mad Max films. And we were sort of hoping that he would end up coming back to direct more Mad Max movies because he's actually written the scripts already for a fifth and a sixth film in that franchise. But now everything is on hold because they are wrapped up in this legal battle. And basically the gist of it is that Uh, Miller's production company is suing Warner Brothers for unpaid earnings. They say that Warner Brothers acted in a, quote, high-handed, insulting, or reprehensible manner. And uh, essentially, they say that, that... they, that Warner Brothers has not paid the production company a bonus fee for delivering the movie under budget. And I guess that there's some disagreement there about what the actual budget of the film was. We know that Hollywood... Uh, accounting numbers can often be a tricky thing to dive into and it seems like the two parties in this case can't fully come to an agreement about what the the budget was there was also a claim from warner brothers that let's let's see i'm going to read from the article here that ht wrote kennedy miller argues that it is eligible for a seven million dollar bonus for making the movie under the agreed 157 million dollar budget while warner brothers claims that it went well over 185 million dollars so that's a pretty big discrepancy and there are cross lawsuits that were filed. I mean, the whole thing just sounds like a big mess. And the end result, unfortunately, is that until this gets settled, we're not going to see any more movies in the Mad Max franchise um, unless they can come up with some sort of loophole that I, I, I can't see of any way of them doing that. So I, I hope this gets settled soon. This is so disappointing because this film was such a critical success, a success at the box office, a success with fans. Like, you know, people who are, you know, we're all like all the quadrants, all the possible quadrants of the the movie going audiences want to see more Mad Max sequels. And uh, Warner Brothers not wanting to uh, give a bonus. I don't know. That just seems so petty. I, I, I mean, I'm sure that bonus is millions of dollars and you know, this is a, a, a big company, but, ah, so disappointing. Um, but that brings us to the end of slash film daily for today. Uh, Ben, where can people find more of your work online? You can find me writing every day at slash film.com. You can track me down on Twitter at Ben pairs, Brad, where can I find you? Of course, SlashRealm.com, also on Twitter at Ethan underscore Anderton, and my own podcast, Go Flix Yourself, on iTunes and other podcast places. You can find me at SlashRealm on Twitter. You can find all the stories we've mentioned on today's podcast on SlashRealm.com and linked in the show notes. SlashRealm Daily is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, and concerns to Peter at SlashRealm.com. Uh, please go rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you tomorrow.